lucky to walk alongside students um, during the most triumphant and tragic times of their life. I've met thousands of students like you. I've talked to them about their hopes and their dreams, their fears and their anxieties, their careers and their families, about what matters to them and about why it matters to them. And over the years, I've noticed that so many of my conversations about so many different challenges and opportunities come down to one simple question, which is a fundamental human question. And recently I was talking with a friend of mine who runs a large video game company. He told me that when he hires people, he only asks them one question, and it's the same question. So if you ever are interviewing for a video game company, remember this question. And what I realized over time is that so much of our personal and professional lives and identities, so much of our spiritual and scholarly orientations are all tied to this one question. And no one asked me this question growing up, even though it was such a central question for what it means to be human. And that question, of course, is what is your true north, or what is your north star? It shouldn't come as a surprise, given the, uh, I think you took the true north, true north test earlier, the score. But what does that mean? It's cool to say, what is your true north? It's intuitive to think about a true north. When I say north star, we kind of know what that means. It means that we kind of have a compass inside of us that points us in a particular direction. But what does it really mean? What does true north really mean? I think different people will answer this question in different ways. You should be empowered, feel empowered, to answer that question in a way that makes sense for you. Your true north will be different than someone else's true north. For me, my true north is not what keeps me up at night. My true north is what gets me up in the morning. You know, we all have stuff that keeps us up at night. We are living in the age of anxiety and in the age of outrage. Um, so we all have stuff that keeps us up at night, but I don't think we need that. That stuff is overrated, it's exhausting. What I think it means to be human is to have something to get up for in the morning. That to me is inspiring. That to me is empowering. That to me is our true north. So I really view true north as meaning and purpose. I, I was raised Hindu, but I spent a lot of time living in a Buddhist monastery. And so in Hinduism and Buddhism, there's this concept called dharma. Dharma is, is a Sanskrit word. It almost has no English translation. But if we were to translate it, it would mean purpose or duty or goal, right? Dharma, for Hindus and Buddhists, is the central goal of human life. The central goal of what it means to be human is to have purpose, to have a trajectory, to have an orientation towards a particular goal. And so the question becomes, how do we live lives of meaning and purpose? Right? And that will change over time. That should change over time. Your purpose at age 5 and 10 and 20 and 30 and 40, and unfortunately for my wife, I can keep going, um, your answer to the question of meaning will change, but the question remains. You know, you're all here because you had the right answers to every question. Right? To get to USC, you took 100 classes. You got 100 grades. You did really well in all of them. You took multiple standardized tests. You did really well in all of them. You have had the right answer to every question, but what are the right questions? If the answers change, and we're trying to find an anchor in the answers, but they change over time. The answers to the questions of meaning and purpose change over time. We're not going to find an anchor in the answers. Where we're going to find an anchor is in the questions. And the question that I think really anchors us is the question of meaning and purpose. And here's what the science tells us. You'll delve into this over the semester. That having a sense of purpose and feeling that we're part of a larger whole is not only good for us personally, but professionally. Research studies show that people who are purpose-driven are four times more likely to be engaged at work. They're 50% more likely to be a leader at work, 60% more likely to have career satisfaction, more likely to have higher self-worth, and to David's point, more likely to have a higher net worth. Living a purpose-driven life is also a strong predictor of happiness and a powerful protective factor against depression. Being purpose-driven could add seven years to your life. Uh, if anyone has seen any of these Blue Zone studies where they look at centenarians, people who have lived the longest, there are certain things about these Blue Zones that are the same. But the, I think the most important thing that is the same about every Blue Zone is that people have a strong sense of purpose. They know what they're doing, where they're going, and why they're doing it. Sometimes that manifests as religion. Religion is a way to think about purpose, but it's not the only way to think about purpose. And the important thing, in my opinion, even as the dean of religious life, isn't religion per se, it's purpose. Religion is a way to purpose, but there are many ways to purpose. And I think what you're going to find is what David said earlier, that your mindset is more important than your skill set. And if your mindset is purpose-oriented, then your mindset will be your destiny. 
I had a good friend named Pico Meyer. As you get older, you might have this experience that I've had where you admire a lot of people and then you get to know those people. And if you're lucky, those people are even more amazing in person than, uh, than you could have imagined. Uh, my favorite writer, one of them growing up, was a man named Pico Meyer, and I got to know him and become, become pretty good friends with him. And we both lived in Santa Barbara um, back in the day. I used to teach at UC Santa Barbara. And he told me a story, he grew up in Santa Barbara, and he told me a story that one day he was sitting in his house up in the hills where I used to live, and he looked around and suddenly there were 75 foot flames all around him. And he realized that he was in the middle of a fire, uh, the kinds of fires that often sweep through the hills of Santa Barbara. And he was living in his childhood home. And he had just a few minutes to grab everything that meant something to him. The pictures of his father, um, the mementos from his childhood, the things that his mother really cared about, and got his mother and him out of there, so they were safe. <coughs> they were relocated in sort of a, a center where all the residents of that neighborhood were. They were basically a, a shelter because all of their homes burned down and everything they owned was gone. And for the first time, even though he'd lived in this neighborhood for decades, he really got to know his neighbors in a different way because they're all going into the shared experience of suffering. And what he told me was he noticed two very different reactions. For some people, they thought, well, my life is basically over. This house was my life. Everything in this house represented my life. That is gone, so I have nothing to live for. Everything I worked for is gone. And their reaction was one of sort of resignation, that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to them, and there's no way for them to move forward in a meaningful way. But then he noticed that some other people had a very different reaction. He noticed even people in the same families, even siblings, had different reactions. So it wasn't a nature-nurture thing, per se. The other reaction was, actually, this is an opportunity. I always wanted to travel the world. I, you know, now that I don't have this house, it, it's kind of like a burden has been lifted. I feel free. I can breathe and I can do the things that I always wanted to. And actually, this house wasn't a house, it was a prison. And so I've been emancipated in some way. Two entirely different reactions. But they're both reflections of mindset, right? One is a sort of fixed mindset, and one is a more sort of growth mindset, where you see the problem as an opportunity. And he stayed close to them over, you know, the years that followed. And what he realized is the people who had the mindset that this was an opportunity really, a few years later, were thriving and flourishing. And the people who told themselves that this was it and not, you know, there was no future. Few years later, we're not. Right? And this comes back to the mindset. Same situation, different approaches. So how do we cultivate that kind of mindset? A mindset that you might call the north mindset, or a growth mindset, or a meaning and purpose mindset. Well, here are three things that you might consider um, when you think about this in your own life. One is, I've kind of talked about this already, this is ask the big questions. And it's another questions, right? The questions are more important than the answers. The right questions are the most important thing. Who am I? What is my purpose? What matters to me? Why does it matter to me? What is my true north? These are questions that connect you to every human who's ever lived. Every human who has ever lived has asked themselves in one way or another, consciously or not, who am I? What does my life mean? This is what makes us human. I don't know if animals are self-reflective in the way that humans are. The, the, the fact that we have such great art that expresses the human condition into poetry and film and dance and music is in some ways evidence of this self-reflection of what it means to be human. Right? And so this idea that we can think to ourselves, what does, you know, that we're self-aware, we think about who am I and what is my purpose and what does it mean to be me, makes us uniquely human and connects us to all humans across space and time. If you're ever feeling lonely or disconnected or you're going through something that no one else is going through, Remember, everyone who's ever lived or will ever live will be asking the same questions of, as you are about who am I, what does my life mean? That is the ultimate connective tissue in the human experience, that question. And so it's important for us to live these questions, to breathe these questions. It's okay if you don't have the right answer. Like I said, the question of who am I at 5, 10, 15, 20 changes. The, I mean, the answer changes, the question remains. So just the, ask, the act of asking the question when I was an undergraduate like you, uh, my academic mentor sat me down and told me his story. He had a story about asking the big questions in his life. His whole life he wanted to become an astronaut. He wanted to go where no one had ever gone before. He wanted to go to the 
far corners of the cosmos. And so back then, if you wanted to be an astronaut, you went to the U US Air Force Academy, and you trained as a pilot, and eventually you worked your way through the system. So I went to the U US Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, and he ended up leaving the academy his senior year because he read a book by Jean-Paul Sartre, the great French existentialist philosopher. And he realized at that moment that he could go into outer space. He could go to the far cosmos, the edge of the galaxy. He could go to where no person had ever gone before. That was possible. But, was, but what was not possible was that no matter how far he went, he could never leave his own mind. And he realized that actually the real adventure for him was not to outer space. The real adventure was to inner space, to the depths of his own mind, which is a place no one had ever been before, too. He was also an explorer in his own mind. And so he gave up the astronaut dream and became a Buddhist philosopher. That's how I met him. And he spent his life right here on Earth on a lifelong mission to explore the universe within himself, which is, you know, what all of us can do. We can all go on a lifelong journey through inner space if we ask ourselves the big question. So I know you're here because you've always had the right answers. I know your success here will be dependent upon the right answers, but the way you feel about your life, the ability to have a north mindset, the ability to thrive and flourish will be more dependent upon the right questions than the right answers. The second one is embrace failure. I mean, this is, you know, listen, all of you are here this evening because you've succeeded at a very high rate. You've been successful students, you've been successful leaders, artists, athletes. You continue to you know, really master all the traditional metrics of success. You're among the most successful students in the world. 9% acceptance rate to get into USC last year. And so I think you have a natural aversion to failure because if you fail, you wouldn't be here. I mean, I know it's really almost hypocritical that you're hearing me lecture about how important it is to fail, but had you failed in your classes, you wouldn't be here to hear the lecture on the importance of failure, right? So it's, I get that, I get that. And yet, over time, what you will find is that you will learn way more from failure than, su than from success. You know? That's where evolution and growth happen. That's how you plant the seeds of success. It's important to know what doesn't work if you want to find out what does work. It's important to know what you don't want to do in order to know what you do want to do. The world may label that as a failure, but that's a necessary precondition to success. The average USC student will change their major four times. That's not failure. That's growth. That's evolution. That's learning. That's changing. You came here to grow. You came here to evolve. If you were the same person you know, that you were when you got here with, that, as you are when you graduate, then you should demand a refund. You did not, do it, you know, you did not get your money to work. And so the way to grow is to fail. You know, That's how you fail. You fail forward, you fail into success. Like I said, I'm a Clippers fan, so I'm very used to failure, like <laughs> really used to failure. But I grew up in the Jordan era, and um, you know, I, I admired Michael, even though I was a Chicago fan. You can't not admire greatness like that. And what I really loved is how we talked about failure, not about success. Michael Jordan said, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot or missed. I failed over and over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. It's like Wayne Gretzky said, you miss every shot that you don't take. Thomas Edison built thousands of prototypes from light bulbs that didn't work before he invented the one that did. Looking back on his journey to build the light bulb, he said, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Edison, Jordan, Gretzky, they're telling us to fail forward. They're telling us to fail into success. And what you'll find if you look at the data is that people generally fail and succeed at the same rate. So those who succeed more also fail more. The more you fail, the more you succeed. We may all succeed at 50%, but if you try 10 times and someone else tries 100 times, well, you'll be successful five times and they'll be successful 50. They'll seem like they're succeeding more, but it's also because they fail more. They fail times. They succeed at 10x, they fail times. And so this is your time. This is your time to fail. This is your time to take risks. You have a safety net here. You can be experimental, you can be bold, you can shoot for the stars, and you may hit the roof. You shoot for the roof, you may not get off the ground. You should throw 10 things to the wall just to see what two or three stick. This is the time when you don't have to work for anyone but yourself. You know, when you were younger, you lived for your parents or your teachers. At some point, you'll be living for your employers, you'll be living for your family, you'll be living for taking care of your parents, you'll be taking care of your kids. 
your partners, your spouses, when do you get to live for yourself? In all this, when do you get you time? This is the time, 18 to 26. Now is the time. You won't ever have a situation like this again where you're just responsible for yourself and your dreams. So go big and fail big and wear that as a badge of success. What I thought when I first started te uh, speaking in this class is all these great people who have spoken in this class would come in here and all they would talk about is how great they are. You won't find that. Every single person who comes in here, who you may have admired from afar or you may admire, admire uh, and knew, every single person who comes here this semester will talk about how they failed. I don't know who's coming this semester. I haven't seen any of the lectures. Everyone will talk about how they failed as the most important thing in their path to success. That's my prediction. They won't talk about their success. They'll talk about their failures. The third point is embrace the wisdom of the grant study. Which is, to me is like a sacred text. Anyone know what the grant study is, or what's shame? I don't know. It's what the largest longitudinal psychology study of humans. Yep. Um, so they took a group of Harvard took a group of men when they were like boys, yeah. right? And then they studied them throughout their entire life. And now it started with just men, but it, it includes many people now. Um, but. It's the largest longitudinal study of humans and what's the most important thing for humans. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The grant study was, as uh, Shane said, started in 1938 at Harvard University. Uh, the idea of the grant study was a study to determine what leads to human fulfillment, human flourishing. The idea was at the end of your life, when you look back upon your life, what are the things that made you feel like you lived a life worth living? essentially. What made you feel like you were flourishing? What brought you happiness? And so they started in 38, 1938 with 200 Harvard undergraduates, your age, but they were all men because Harvard didn't go co-ed until 1977, whereas USC was co-ed inclusive from day one. So be grateful you're here. Yeah, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, so anyway, so they followed these men around for the rest of their life for 75 years. Uh, and over the lifespan of the grant study, the research team analyzed the data and trends uh, using the most sophisticated interdisciplinary methodologies and approaches from the humanities and the social sciences. And they discovered one thing. You know, they spent $25 million, 75 years, and they said they basically said they could summarize their study findings in a five-word conclusion. What's the most important thing in your life to make you feel like you're flourishing? Okay, someone else? Mm -hmm. Yes? Relationships? That's it. The five word conclusion is happiness is love, full stop. You know, it's what the Beatles told us all those years ago all you need is love. It's what the Bee Gees told us how deep is your love. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom there. So, the grand study is that study. The grant study is the study that tells us the truth, which is the most important thing in our life are relationships. You're here at USC, you think you're here at USC because you're getting a degree or a certificate or that you're here for the grade, right? But the reality is you're here to meet each other. You know, you're not gonna remember that much from your classes, I hate to say it, but you will never forget the things that happened outside of the classroom. You might not remember what any of your professors say 20 years later, but you'll never forget the experiences you had with your friends in recreational sports, in Greek life, on the Daily Trojan, in, um, you know, in, in a study abroad program, uh, in religious life, in a community service program. Because all of those experiences bring you into relations with each other. They bring you into relations with each other, and that's what you're here for. You're here to know each other. Are they graduating seniors this year? Oh, a lot. All right, so here's my advice to graduating seniors. My advice to you is, this semester, make sure you spend time with people you love. I'm the only Indian uncle who will tell you to prioritize your social life over your academic life. <laughs> Ask any of your Indian friends. It's never happened before, it'll never happen again. A break in the space-time continuum right now, as I say this. But you should spend time with your friends. That's the most important thing. That's what you're going to miss. Every year during commencement, I see the same thing. I see students who are so stoked to graduate. They've been looking forward to this 
for years. They can't wait to get out of this place. They're so happy that morning of graduation. And if they're Marshall students, they're a little drunk too, you know that. <laughs> the night opens at like 4 a.m. after a lot of class being passing around and Marshall second meeting with us. But they're really happy, right? And then by the afternoon, you start to see almost like a deer in the headlight look, where it's like, oh my goodness, I was so happy to leave this place, but that means I leave my friends. And I haven't actually, I'm not ready to leave my friends. And so there's a really bittersweet moment where it's celebratory and then it's kind of a little tragic. Don't be in that position. Just tell your friends you love them before you graduate. Spend the time with the people you care before you graduate. The grant study tells us that's the most important thing in life. That's the most important thing in life. We don't have to get to the end of our life before we figure that out. We can learn from those who came before us. If you have three friends who are ride or die friends, who will not judge you, who will be there for you no matter what, that's all you need. Don't buy the hype that you need 10,000 friends online. Don't think that everyone has more friends than you. It's not true. It's just, it's just an illusion. The reality is all you need are three people who have your back. And if you have that, you're good. And so that's what I want really for all of you. And I want you to really think about what it means to live a life without regret. I think to me that's become my new norm. What does it mean to live a life without regret? So the question then becomes, well, what do people regret? Your, uh, Professor Blasso and I really love this book by, uh, by someone named Ronnie Ware. Ronnie Ware was a palliative care nurse uh, for 15 years in Australia. That means she basically did hospice care. She was with people at the end of their lives. She sat with people on their deathbeds. She had the most honest conversations with people at the most vulnerable times in their life. When you're on your deathbed and you're looking back on your life, there's complete honesty. You're not wearing any masks. You're not trying to front. You're not trying to lie. There's complete honesty in that moment. And for 15 years, she walked alongside people, sat alongside people as they went through this final transition, as all of us will. And what she realized is that people had the same five regrets. It didn't matter where they came from, what age they were, you know, what their religion was, what their background was. They had the same five regrets. And so she wrote a book, appropriately called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. What do you think those five regrets are? What are the five regrets? And the reason I say this is my new version of a true north mindset is living my life so I get to the end without these regrets. That is what I think now, what I think about a purpose-driven life. How do I live my life so I don't have these regrets at the end? Get the back. Yeah. Uh, savoring your close relationships. Yeah, so one of the regrets was, I wish I had spent more time with my family and friends. Period. I wish I had spent more time, that's the grant study. I wish I had spent more time with my family and friends. We don't have to get to the end of our lives to recognize that truth. Yes. Tunnel vision. Tunnel vision. Yeah, that's good. I like the way you, you, you put that. You, you said tunnel vision. Um, but one of the regrets was, actually, I wish I had the courage to be myself as opposed to the person that I thought people would want me to be. So it's sort of like, I wish I wasn't so focused on the things that the world thought I should be focused on, and I wish I honored my own authentic being, my own internal compass, which is pointing me in a different direction. So that's great. Courage to live the life I wanted to live, not the life others thought I should. And I wish I, um, I, wish I could stay in touch with my family and friends. Yes? Oh, this might be kind of general, but I wish I did. It's interesting you say this, I wish I did more. Actually, it's a bit of a flip side. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. That's the regret. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. No one in on their deathbed is thinking, I wish I'd gotten an A and not a B plus in that class in college. No one is thinking, I wish I had gone to med school at 24 and not 23. No one is thinking, I wish I would gotten into the fraternity that I didn't get into. No one is thinking, I wish I had spent more time in, at the office and less time at home. No one. No one is thinking, I wish I had got that promotion. No one. These are the things that keep us up right now. You may be kept up by grades. You may be kept up by job. You may be kept up by other things that seem like you're all encompassing, and yet at the end of your life, that's not, you're not going to be thinking about any of that. And maybe that gives us some comfort. Maybe it allows us not to fully go down the rabbit hole of anxiety on things that seem overwhelming right now, if we know that 
over the course of our life, these are things that we're not going to actually remember, and we're going to wish we didn't work as hard. And that's why I say you're here to meet each other. When you're procrastinating with your friends at 3 in the morning instead of doing studying for your exam, that's what you're here to do. You're here to procrastinate with your friends at 3 in the morning. That's the goal. That's the stuff you remember. That brings you into relationships. Have no guilt about that. You will I can't believe I'm on the beach like this, the guy with five degrees, but you're not going to remember the grade on that test. It won't materially change your life, but that relationship will change your life. Okay, good. Okay, I wish I hadn't worked this hard. I wish I had the courage to live my life the way I wanted to. I wish I had kept in touch with family and friends. Or the other two. Yes. We're regretting saying no instead of yes. Probably. Yeah, I think that's the, 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 the way this comes out is I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. So there's two. There's I wish I had the courage to live the life I wanted to, and I also wish I had expressed how I felt. So maybe. Maybe, maybe you wanted to say yes and you said no. I wish I had the courage to actually do the thing that I wanted to do and tell people what I wanted, how I felt at that moment. So that's the fourth one. And the fifth one, yeah? Like, I wish I just like, enjoyed and cherished every moment when it's stress. That's great. And the way it's framed in the book is, I wish I had let myself be happier. Mm -hmm. That at the end of your life, you realize that the impediment to your own happiness, maybe your own sense of flourishing, wasn't external but internal. It wasn't anyone else but you. You don't regret the things you have no control over. I'm not gonna, if the Clippers never win a championship on my deathbed, I can't regret that because I have no control over that, right? You only regret the things you can control. And so at some point, people at the end of their life realize that they controlled, they were the gatekeepers of their own happiness. That happiness wasn't a state of being that was determined by the external world, but a choice that one makes for themselves, and that they had the power to make that choice. So I think for me now, true north means how do I get to the end of my life where I don't feel like all I've done is work too hard, that I did spend time with my family and friends, that I did have the courage to express myself and live the life that I wanted to live, that I realized that sometimes I get in my own way of my own happiness because of my mindset, and I can change my mindset to get to where I want to be. So that to me is, is my true north. And I think over the course of the semester, all of you will have some version of this for yourself. And this is a great journey that you're on. You're going to write the story that you're going to live. You end up becoming the story that you tell about yourself. You all tell a story about who we are, whether we're aware of it or not. You might as well be conscientious about telling that story in the way that you want. Tell the story of who you are, uh, tell the story of who you want to be, and go be that person. This is your time to do that. Lastly, I'll just say, listen, it's a hard time in the world. Um, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain on campus, there's a lot of pain in the world. I was over the break with my one of my, one of my spiritual teachers, uh, Deepak Chopra, um, and he told me there are five crises in the world. There are five crises. The first four many of us know about, many of you are working on, many people on our campus are working on. War, justice, health, sustainability. Those are four major crises the world is going through right now. I think all of us want to be part of the solution to that. But what he also told me was the fifth crisis was the most important. The fifth crisis is something all of us can help solve. And if we don't solve the fifth crisis, we can't solve the other. And the fifth crisis, he said, was the crisis of joy. We have a crisis of joy in the world. And I think all of us can be a solution to that crisis by trying to find moments of joy in our own lives. That doesn't mean we always have to be happy. That's impossible. That doesn't mean we have to be naive to the suffering of the world. That's, that's silly. That doesn't mean we can't be empathetic to the pain of others. Of course, we should be. We need to be. That doesn't mean we deny the reality of other crises, war, justice, sustainability, and health. Of course we have to. But can we have moments of joy? Even moments of joy. And what I want you to think about is how that joy might be self-generated as opposed, as opposed to being externally generated. You know, um, <clears throat> there's a study at Cornell University that it's, it's more important to spend your money on experiences than on things, right? Because experiences bring us into communities where things are solitary. They're not 
You just have them yourself. They're not really shared, right? They isolate you. If I get a car, I'm happy. If I crash that car, I'm sad, right? The thing comes and goes. If my happiness is dependent on that thing, my happiness will come and go. But instead of buying, back in the day, we bought these things called CDs, right? Instead of buying a CD, maybe I'll go to a concert. And if I go to that concert, that's a better way for me to spend that money because I'm going to go with a friend. I'm going to have a memory that marks that time in my life. And I'm going to share it with someone. And that will stay with me. So experiences bring us joy. Things are fleeting. <laughs> you are at a university where you can be very rich in experience. You are at a university where you can tell new stories. There are some great pioneers, Trojan pioneers that came before you, you know, who were in their footsteps. Neil Armstrong and America Ferreira, Rob Kardashian. And like you guys are like, right in the footsteps of the pioneers. And so you, know, you should really feel as though this is your time to think about how you internally generate joy. It's not dependent on the external conditions of the world, but that you control that comes out of your own need. I am here for you in any way I can be helpful as you go through this journey. I oversee the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. We're at the University Religious Center. We have 50 chaplains. We have 90 religious groups. We have atheist groups. Atheists is Raspians, A and Z. We have everything. So wherever you are in your journey, spiritual but not religious, humanist or religious, there's a community, a home, and there are people here for you. So please don't feel like you're alone. Come see me. And that's all I got. <laughs>
So I, my, my, my group teacher is with this, but I'm in group. But I've studied Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. I teach a class of 200 here that's basically a comparative religion course. So for me, the way I am a good Hindu is by being a good Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Sikh. It just so happens that that perspective is really helpful when you're at the university job. Because I oversee all those groups. That's a great question. Yes. How did you come to that conclusion that this is your purpose? Okay. Yeah, that's so that was a good one. That's a great one. So not, here's not the, medical school. Yeah, I had twelve physicians in my family, and so no one calls me doctor. <laughs> no one thinks my PhD in religion is a real degree. Even my nine-year-old is like, when I grow up, I want to be a real doctor. Like, why? Not like you. <laughs> like, why don't you get through fourth grade before you talk shit about my PhD? <laughs> um, anyway, sorry, that I digress. So I think this was my purpose. You know, here's the thing I think is important when we're talking about meaning. I think we think that we find meaning, right? I think we think we find meaning. So I'm here at college, and I'm here to find meaning, and here's meaning, and here I am. And I'm just like, can I try all these things, try these majors, meet these people, and at some point I'll find meaning, and I'll always have it. I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't think we find meaning and purpose. I think we make meaning, and we make purpose. And we have to do that throughout our lives. It's not something you get to and you check it off and you're done. That's not the way meaning and purpose works. It's something you renew constantly. So how do you make meaning and purpose? Well, you make meaning and purpose through your relationships, through your actions, through having an open mind and having an open heart. For me, this was I was in college pre-internet. It wasn't that sophisticated. I was like, who has the best job in what I know? And it was my comparative religion professor. And so I was like, I want to do that. And then when I met the Dalai Lama, it inspired me more. And it wasn't like at that point I was like, this is it. I just had to keep renewing it. I had to keep putting, keep following it. I got multiple degrees in religion. You know, I I kept following it, not knowing where it would go. Martin Luther King Jr. said, faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the staircase. That's kind of what I feel like meaning making is. It's having a little bit of faith in the work that you're doing, knowing that it's not something you find, but something you make. So that it's not, in, it's not something that if you don't find it, you can't get it. It's not accidental or fortuitous. It's in your power to make meaning for yourself. And you don't have to make meaning or find purpose in your life right now. You just have to make meaning and find purpose in this moment right now. And if you make meaning and find purpose in every moment of your life, then you have have a purpose for your life. You only live in the individual moments. You don't live your life all at once. In any moment, there are two things that are true about your life. One is that you were born and you will die. Truth. The second is, there's only two truths, by the way. Maybe taxes. There's really only two truths. The second is uh, every moment of your life is the present moment. You never live in the future and you never live in the past. When you think about the future, you're thinking about it in the present moment. But when you encounter it, it's the present. When you think about the past, you're thinking about it in the present moment. When you encountered it, it was the, it was the present. You only live your life in the present moment. Everyone who has ever lived has only lived their life in the present moment. So if we can find meaning and purpose in the moment, that is the goal. We don't have to think about how do I have, find meaning and purpose in this large, abstract sort of concept called life. Because life is just the present moment. You will never not be in the present moment. Um, how do you strike a balance between um, the Fascinating or yeah. That's great that you're self-aware and that you're thinking about balance. Um, I think it's different for different people. You've got to find something that feels right for you. You know, I don't want to undermine the fact that like, you were here to get a degree. Of course you are. You need to go to school. You need to go to class. You shouldn't be only procrastinating. But I. I what I don't want you to do is to think that if you are procrastinating or spending time with friends, you're doing something wrong. Because I, I think that's the stuff that matters over life. School matters more in the short term, next job. Relationships matter more over life, overall health and well-being. Sometimes you have to zoom out, you know? And so it's a, there's no real, it's hard to find balance. I don't know if you'll ever feel like I found the right balance. It's hard, especially in this country, to find balance because you work really hard. So I don't know if, if, if balance can be the right goal. I think maybe it's just what fulfills you. And what fulfills you is going to be different than what fulfills 
your roommate, right? And that's good, that's fine. It's not a cut and paste thing. I want you to have confidence in what fulfills you. You are the expert of you. No one else is the expert of you. You know you better than anyone knows you, so trust that. That's the compass. That's pointing you in a particular direction. Now we have the, if you believe this north thing, that we have a compass that's pointing us towards our true north, um, then, um, then you have to learn to trust your gut. We are all type A people. I, I'm a lawyer by training. I, everything I do, I have a pro and cons list. But for the most important decisions in my life, I just trusted my gut. There's some primordial wisdom in our gut. It's pointing us in a direction for a reason. It's important that we don't ignore that, even if it doesn't make sense. Like I said, the career I chose did not make sense. It does not make sense to go study religion and live in a monastery if you want to have a career. It just doesn't. It worked out well for me, but my gut told me this was something I needed to do. When I met the woman I loved, I didn't really, we didn't really know each other that well. I met her in Rio. She was from South Africa. We knew each other six months, and we wanted to get married. And there were a thousand reasons for us not to get married. But the, my gut was like... And so when I think about my life, my career, like the really important decisions, they weren't logical. They were gut-related. So when you're thinking about this balance between you know, friends and school and other things, also check in with your gut. We're not, we haven't been trained to think with, that, with the gut because it's not semantical. It doesn't come out in words. It's a feeling. But if you have a strong feeling pointing you in a particular direction, you should honor that. Yes. What steps do you take or what do you do to overcome a loss? Overcome what? A loss. Uh, an experience in life. Or yeah. Failure experience. Yeah, that's great. How do you how do you wrestle with loss or overcome loss? I think it's it's easier for me to overcome to wrestle with failure because I fail every day. My wife makes sure I that's what I every day. So I, I know I'm an imperfect being, and you have to give yourself a little grace. We're all trying our best, but we're imperfect beings. Um, I think the harder thing is the loss of someone you love um, because failure you can remedy the loss of someone you love. That feels more final. That's why it's so important for you to tell the people you love that you love them. You know, the hardest part of my job is student death. We have 50,000 students on our campus. I've probably overseen more student memorials than anyone in the country over the last 15 years. I am every year, every week, almost sitting with parents crying. I feel guilty that I get to go home to my kid and they don't get to go home to their kid. The parents are never asking me when they're in my office. Why did my kid major in this or that? Why did they get a B and not a C? All they want is another day with their kid. That's it. That's all they want. And so I think the way to deal with loss is to try to front end it, to make sure you've said what you have said to the people you love so that you're not in a position to, have, to wish you had said, you know, if you have beef, if you have bad blood, if it's not sitting right, now, we think we have a lot of time, we don't. I think COVID showed us how precious our time is. Um, and it's hard to deal with the loss of someone if you didn't say all the things you wanted to say. We'll, we'll talk about loss, setbacks, and failure that's not you know, losing someone. Yeah. And that's, that's a really important question because all of us you know, are in a room full of perfectionists. We're used to winning, we're used to getting the right scores, the grades, all that stuff. And yet, your self-talk when you have a setback is not that this didn't work, this startup didn't work, or I didn't get the job. Um, you know, the self-talk can quickly go to "I am a failure." I am, a, you know, that type of like global talk. Um, we'll talk about how to change that narrative. He certainly is great at sort of nature nurture narrative, but we'll we'll talk about that. And it is sort of treating yourself as you would treat a best friend. You know, we're all way harder on ourselves than we are when we're counseling a great friend who didn't get the job, didn't get the grade, didn't get the guy, whatever the failure setback is, there's a way to sort of start modifying your self-talk. Um, because you're not, like, getting back to the, getting accustomed to failing. I mean, if anybody's, you know, a Gary Vaynerchuk fan, you know, he just spoke at our event, he's been in this class several times, but he talks like about getting used to losing. Because we are not accustomed to it. The fear of embarrassment, the fear of what will my parents say, what will my friends say, Get the, I, I feel like I haven't failed enough in, in, in life. I really have tried to do things that are more, I'll say, risky in like the grand sense, but like putting myself out there because I was so accustomed to winning. 
And if the earlier you can get used to like not winning at everything, losing, taking risk, and not caring what other people think, you are just set up to be like an extraordinary performer. You know, one of, one of our other guests, Michael Gervais, is probably going to come in. Dr. Michael Gervais, a, you know, a high high stakes sports psychologist. You know, who was with the Seahawks, but also with like, you know, people that risk their lives in high stakes sports. He just wrote a book on uh, what is it, FOPO, fear of other people's opinions. The whole thing like that is like a tenant to being a high performer. It's like not you care about the people that are close to you and what they think, but you don't care about opinions just because they're opinions of you. So. We'll get deeper into that. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah, you on that, no, but I just think it's really important to understand that embrace the setback, embrace the failure, embrace <laughs> the rejection, because that that is the path to like the other side of that. That's that's the path to the bliss. Yeah, yeah I thank you. I, I, there's a, a text that means a lot to me. It's the oldest Hindu text. It's called the Bhagavad Gita. And the main teaching, in the one of the main teachings is. Focus on the work, but don't be attached to the fruits of the work. The, the important thing is the work. Someone said this about piano playing. It was beautifully said. It was, I kind of said it better myself. That the important thing is the actual playing, not the goal. We're distracted in some ways by the goal. If we're just goal-oriented in life, we go between goal and goal, and we miss a lot of what's happening between those goals. Life is actually happening between those goals. But if we're process-oriented, then we're always in the, the moment. That means we're always in life. I think it's important to be process-oriented as opposed to goal-oriented. Um, and the, what the Gita says is, don't be attached to the fruits of your labor. So what that really means is maximum effort, minimum attachment. I will put my best effort, and I will be unattached to the fruits. That's really hard to do. This could be an aspiration. So if I lose or if I fail, I'm not attached. But I feel good about the effort that I put in. That's actually what it's important. I didn't fail if I put in my maximum effort way of reimagining what the goal the process is the goal the, the way you live is the goal of life as opposed to something you're achieving then it re sort of it, it reframes what failure actually is yeah um, I know you talk about like spirituality a lot do you think, do you think uh, like things happen for a reason you yes I do to what extent I mean, it's hard to know. Um, I, you know, on a very basic level, it's causal. You know, in, in, the, in India, we call it karma. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker the other day, my karma ran over your dogma. <laughs> you didn't let me do it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that means, but I don't understand. So karma is action-reaction. So we all know this. This is Newton's third law. For every action, there is a reaction. If I plant a seed, it grows. That's causality. So things happen for a reason on one level because of causality. You are in this class because you registered for this class. There's a causal relationship between an action and a result. I go a little further. I think things happen because of, this is the Hindu, I believe in reincarnation. So I believe things happen for reasons that we don't know about in this life. But part of the process of this life is to, is to work through that, even if we're not sure why. So, I'm not sure if we'll, you will know why things happen for a reason, but if you think things happen for a reason, it allows us to find meaning and purpose in the things that are happening. Why is this happening? What is the reason behind it? Right? Why am I here? Right? You belong at USC. You're here. <coughs> when you're here, your journey is to sort of discover why you're here. Not that, not do I belong here. Yes, you belong here. And now the question is why do you belong here? Right? And so, um, so I think things happen for a reason, and the beauty of life is figuring out what that reason is. You know, or making sense of what's happened, knowing there's a reason behind it, even if you don't know what that reason is. Having faith that I am meeting everyone here for a reason tonight. You're having this conversation for a reason. This is not a coincidence, this is not an accident. If I'm supposed to be here and you're supposed to be here, then whatever comes up in this conversation is supposed to come up in ways that we can make sense of. So I think it can be a protective factor against the unpredictability of the world to believe that things happen for a reason. Maybe it's just a faith or superstition, but it helps mitigate the anxiety for sure. To feel like there's a hidden hand at work. Yes. On the topic of relationships, do you think everyone has one person, no. one life, one partner? No. <laughs> That's too much pressure. <laughs> I think you have multiple um, soulmates, and 
even if you're with your partner that you're supposed to be with, it's work. Relationships are work. And the reason they're work is because you learn more about yourself than you learn about your partner. When you're in a relationship with someone, especially a romantic relationship with someone, it's like a mirror that's being held up to you. I thought I was like the coolest guy ever until I got married. I'm like, dude, I'm an asshole. You know, I, saw myself, I saw myself through the eyes of my wife, and I saw all these things that I would never have seen before, right? So I think it's work because it's inner work. You have to do the work of transforming yourself to be with the person you're with. It's not static. It's not like you find that person and that's it. There are seasons in relationships that are good and bad. You, know, it's, you won't find a long marriage that doesn't have a bad season in it. And so um, I think that we all have to do the work no matter what. But I think there's one person, and if, if you don't get that one person, you'll never get it. That's, I don't think it's true. It's a lot of pressure. It can be kind of toxic, actually, in that way. And um, you're always looking over your shoulder, which is healthy. Like, you're with someone who's going to need to be a lot of focus on getting more. So I, I don't think there's just one person. So can I ask yeah, a follow up question? How do you make that work with your wife? <laughs> this could be a whole course. <laughs> yeah, on or not work, you know. Um, I mean, 17 years, it's, you have to reinvent it. You have to reinvent it yourself. Now that we have a one year old at home, and so it's different when you're seeing your wife also as a mother in a different role, or when you're working together as a strategic partnership. Like a marriage is also like a business partnership, it's, it's a team, right? You're investing in each other's success. And so, um, it's a tough question. I'm not sure I, I'm always, I, I know I'm not always successful in making work, but I think we both know we have to do the work. And the more we work, the better it is. Can I just point, um, you know, in between the quips that he's made about it, what is your greatest achievement in life? Yeah, it's marrying my wife. Convincing her, he says yeah, that. Convincing her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that to go on that um, and, and I'm the person you should not take a relationship with. So I'll tell you how not to do it. But, uh, it's, it's, oh, that's fine. We'll start going from that. Yeah. Oh, hey. Yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry, I didn't off. see that part. Um, nice to meet you. Of course. Um, I was just wondering how do you apply personally, um, like the experience of joy? I know right. that's a cross so question, good. but they're great questions. How do I experience joy? You know, my, my teacher is the Dalai Lama, and my wife is from South Africa. She grew up under apartheid. She spent a lot of time with um, another Nobel Peace Prize laureate, um, Desmond Tutu. And Desmond Tutu led, um, you know, was a leader during apartheid. And the Dalai Lama was a leader during exile. These two human beings saw more, much suffering as any human being in the 20th century saw. And they're really close. And they wrote a book, and they called that book The Book of Joy. And I'm thinking, you know, why would folks who have seen so much suffering write a book called The Book of Joy? But when you're around the Dalai Lama and you're around Desmond Tutu, it's all laughter. It's all laughter all the time. Somehow they're able to laugh. And so for me, joy is just a non-judgmental moment of laughter, of elation, of happiness. It just doesn't have to happen for a reason. It can just be a feeling. If you feel that, just honor it. Just take a moment and be like, this is joy. This is what joy feels like. I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to do it with this joy. It's fleeting, but it's there. Sorry, I like kind of lost my voice. Okay, I can. Uh, I'm just I'm a big warrior about the future, yeah. and what you said about being in the present and finding joy in the present like really stuck with me. I'm just wondering, as someone who's like a massive like anxious person, how do you like even start kind of trying to live in the present rather than focusing yeah. on things that could go wrong? It's a great question. The reality is we can't just live in the present all the time. You have to focus on the future. You're you've got career goals. You've got academic goals, you've got dreams. Things just don't happen if you don't plant the seed. So you have to focus on the future. Um, so but can you also be in the present? That's really the question. Can you have a moment where you take a breath every moment and you're in the moment? Non-judgmental in the present. When you start to get anxious, can you take a breath and ground yourself in the moment, right? Can you have tools that bring you back to the moment when you need to be in the moment? As a sort of 
protective factor maybe against the anxiety of the unknown in the future. There's no way to not think about the future, but there is a way to not think about the present. We're really distracted in the present. Our phones have kept us distracted. All the information is distracting us. It's almost like at this point we'll do anything to not be present right at this moment. And so I'm not saying don't think about the future. I'm saying also think about the present, right? My teacher, Don Hanna, said to me, he said, if you can if you can do if you can't do anything about it, why stress? So if you're thinking about the future and you can't do anything about it, why stress? If you can do something about it, why stress? Just go do the thing you can do. So his point was like, either way, why why are you stressing? And I sort of asked him that question. So I think that's that's the thing. If you're anxious about something you have no control over, maybe find a way to just let it go. Realize you have no control over that. This anxiety is not serving you well. Stress causes inflammation. Inflammation causes disease. Disease kills us. The stress will literally kill us. It will literally kill us. It's not self-serving as well. If you can't do anything about it, why stress? If you can do something about it, then that stress can be focused on that thing that you can do. But um, I think part of it is just seeing, just accepting your things beyond your control and making peace with that. And realizing the things you do control are actually more important than you control. Yes? Do you have tools for overcoming social anxiety? Uh, I'm yeah, the question because people may not. Yeah, do you have tools for overcoming social anxiety? I'm like an extreme introvert, so this is my tool to answer to people. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I think you need to be in. You need to have people who you feel safe with, comfortable with. You don't need to be, like I said, in communities that seem big. You don't need to have thousands of friends online. You just need to have a few friends. Uh, in life, you don't need to go to every event. You don't really need to put yourself in a social situation if it's not serving you. We're all built differently. Just because someone thrives, some people are extroverted, some people are introverted. Um, I'm super introverted, my wife's extroverted. We complement each other well. There are real joys in being introverted. Right? I crave solitude. I crave my own space. I love being alone. And so, if you feel that, then lean into the things that make you feel fulfilled. Your roommate might feel fulfilled with the party. You might feel fulfilled with a book. That's fine. We can normalize what works for us. Right? We don't have to get anxious about the anxiety. We don't have to feel bad about feeling bad. We don't have to confound the suffer. Um, but in terms of getting out in the world, I would say just be with people you trust. And realize everyone has some amount of social anxiety. I would just have some empathy for everyone. Everyone on our campus, not everyone. I'll set, I would say 70% of the students I meet feel very lonely, feel like they're imposters, feel like everyone's figured it out with them, feel like everyone got into the party with them, and have fun. I think social media has a lot to do with this. And so I constantly have students in my office telling me I'm lonely, and the next one is telling me I'm the only lonely student here. I'm like, no, actually, most students are. And the kid with 100,000 friends online is also lonely. And so, I think it's important to normalize that, that if you feel something, you're not the only one who feels it. Everyone feels it. Everyone's kind of working through it. You can have empathy for others. And realize that people will also have empathy for you. People are, we're often harder on ourselves than the world where other people are on us. We judge ourselves worse than the world where other people do. We beat ourselves up in ways that other people won't. If I have an idea, I have 10, I have 10 immediate thoughts of why I can't do it. And if I can get past those 10 thoughts that I generate in my own mind, I can generally do it. The universe is much more forgiving of my thoughts than I am of my own thoughts. Right? And so some of it is just creating some space in your own mind's eye to give yourself permission to go out to the party and not sort of worry about all the things that other people are doing. Yes? First of all, thank you for coming to see. Um, my question is about the model you're talking about, about the fiber grips. Yes. For, um, but like, I'm just curious, is there anyone who had no regrets? There very well might have been. Um, I hope that's all of us <laughs> in the class. Um, but uh, I think the book, she really wrote. I think her thing was these are five regrets that are universal, so it's applicable to everyone. So she, it would be interesting to ask her that question. Think about the book. 
Do you think it's really possible to have regrets in your life? No, I think we all regret things. Um, but what I also think is we regret the things we don't do. We don't regret the things that we do do. If you start a business and fail, you'll regret it less than if you don't try. Um, yeah, that's a tentative thing. Okay. You know, right, like, let's make it to the side. There's awesome. a lot of questions here. Uh, like, especially with your religious background, yeah. I imagine you think about like self discipline and self control yeah. a lot. How do you go about like, acting upon that kind of balancing it between yeah. uh, leisure and question. self discipline? I mean, that's super important. It's maybe the most important thing. Um, part of that is what we were talking about earlier in terms of healthy habits. And I think what I've realized from, um, from religion is. Here's my point of view. You don't need religion, but you need something sacred. You don't need religion, but you need the things that religion has historically provided people. What has religion historically provided people? It's provided people a sense of meaning, purpose, an ethical framework, a community of care, songs and stories to live by, and a sense that you're part of a reality that's greater than yourself. A sense of beauty, a sense of awe, a sense of joy. And this is what it means to be human. Religion has been the place where these things have resided. We're moving to a culture that's not religious, but these things are still important. Right? One of those important things is ritual, and the way we ritualize our life, whether we know it or not. And so I think part of the way I can think about self-discipline is through ritual. That if you're gonna play the piano, that's that's a ritual that's, that's marking time. The way we mark time is by doing a ritual. We all have rituals whether we know it or not. We wake up and we have a cup of coffee, that's a ritual. That's Think about it like a religious ritual. And so if you think about the things you need to do in a ritualized way, um, it's marking time in a way that you're more likely to do them. Um, and so I think that's where discipline comes in. That said, I also believe that you know everything in moderation, including moderation, you know, sometimes you gotta go a little nuts and sometimes you gotta, you know, throw discipline aside and have a little fun too. So uh, my own approach isn't super rigorous, but when I need to get things done, um, I try to order my day. You know? And then I'm a list guy. I make lists and I cross things off, and I feel like I'm getting, I'm, I'm disciplined if I get those things done. Uh, there's someone who said like the the most pro the most productive things, the most productive way you could be is every morning make a list of the five things you need to do. The most important thing of the day, put that first. And don't do the other four until you do that one first. Right? You just, if that's the way you're ordering your, your life, you're going to have some amount of discipline. The lists are really good. It feels good to cross that off. Sometimes <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do something that's not on my list, and I'll write it on my list, and I'll cross it off. <laughs> just because I want to honor the fact that I did that. Right? It gets you... It keeps you going, it gives you momentum, a body in motion stays in motion. If I, can do, if I have to do 20 things in a day, I can do 30. If I have to do one thing, I can't do it. Just can't do it, and so discipline um, sort of um, comes out of itself. You know, the more disciplined you are, the more disciplined you become because the more momentum you have, the more you can, the more you do, the more you can do. And we can all do more than we think we can do. When you have a certain amount of discipline around it, you see that. So I don't know if that really is a good answer, but that's a good question. <laughs> we'll, we'll get some more in input from. People really on the bleeding edge of performance, and you know everybody wants to be a high achiever, an outlier. There, there's some things that you're going to give up to be in that space. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not all nice. roses to be in that space. We've had some people here, so we'll talk about that. And you know, uh, whether musicians or athletes, the people who practice and really build something, it takes time. So I, if you haven't read the book, you know, read this book and you're going to study atomic habits, <clears throat> and you'll start seeing like. This is the greatest, I, I heard it this week, like it's the greatest gift that you can give yourself and your self-worth and your um, uh, mental health is to build things in the habit because we're just riddled with 10,000 decisions a day. And the more things you can take from the executive part of your brain and put them in sort of the you know, prime part of your brain, um, you're removing all that anxiety and decision making. So I, I'm, I'm in that pursuit as well. I really... I, I wish I knew this at 20. I would be more disciplined, but it's it's about really showing up and, and building the habit on what's important to you. But the, um, you know, the beating ourselves up in our minds about I'm not, you know, I'll say I'm not disciplined. I'm not disciplined. And then I look at the, you know, like if I were to say that to him, are you kidding me? 
like the things that he's seen me create and do over time. And then you gotta remind yourself, I am really disciplined on these things. I'm just not disciplined on practicing piano yet, but I'm getting there. So I think it's, it's a practice that you build. Um, let's see how this goes. I have a question about identity. Yeah. I think at times we're like categorizing ourselves in the boxes yeah. of what we are. Yeah. And especially like as an athlete, I've noticed it's really difficult moving on if you're like injured or trying to like focus on something that's not necessarily your choice yes. and it's such a big part of your life. Yeah. What advice do you have someone that's switched out? Ooh. Question about identity and especially transitioning identity if you're an athlete and maybe you're not. All of you will have some version of this. All of you have been students your whole life. Every September, you know exactly where you're going to be the next September. You knew you were going to be in school, even if you didn't know what school. For the half of you who are graduating, this is the first year of your life that many of you actually don't know what you're going to be doing in the fall. That's liberating, I think, but it can be terrifying as well. Um, that's an identity transition. We all go through some version of this when we aren't parents and then we're parents. When we're not married and then we're married. When we're not employed and then we're employed. When we're a student, not a student. When you, know? you sell a business that you put everything into and you're no longer the CEO founder, like that's a big identity crisis. And so this, I, I think what you're talking about in terms of identifying as an athlete and then maybe not being an athlete um, at the same level um, has other corollary, corollaries that you'll experience in other ways in your life. It's not specific just to that. It's part of this larger idea that we go through different identities throughout our life. That's what we should be doing, right? Life is about evolution and growth, you know? Um, you write the different chapters of your life and you live those chapters and you're living this beautiful chapter now and it's brought you a lot of joy and the identity has been um, something that's brought you meaning, it's brought you into a community of people, it's given you a sense of purpose, it's given you probably, being an athlete, it's given you a lot of the things that we're talking about right, right now, a sense of awe. But you don't need to be an athlete to have all those things. You have to, you can just trust that at some point, you know, at some point you're, you weren't gonna be an athlete. Even if you went, you know, even if you're a professional athlete, you know, by 40, you were, you're not going to be a professional athlete. Every athlete, no matter how successful they are, have, has to sort of navigate this in their own way, right? And so um, that was always going to be the case. Um, I think you should just feel good about the fact that you were, you had a dream of being a D1 athlete at the best school in the world, and you manifest that. And now you can manifest your next dream. And you wrote that story and you lived it, now you write the next story and live it. And the same things that made you successful in this iteration will make you successful in the next iteration. And if you believe things happen for a reason, the door that is closed, I wrote a, I'm a big Bob Marley fan, I wrote a book on Bob Marley. Uh, Bob Marley said, when one door closes, many others are open. Not one, you know, I, I used to think, when one door closes, another door opens. No, when one door closes, a universe of possibility opens. Many doors open, right? And so you could think of this as a closing of one door, or you could think of this as the opening of many, many doors that you're supposed to walk through or explore. This was that you needed to go through this. That it wasn't it wasn't something bad, but something good. That it wasn't a crisis, but the opportunity, right? So it's just a kind of a way to reframe the things that you're going through. And if you're able to do that successfully, when you go through these other kinds of transitions from student to employee, from, you know, single to not, so whatever it might be, from, you know, old, you know, what I'm doing right now, from, Someone who's younger to someone who's older. Like we all have these transitions in our life. There are different seasons of our life. I, I, I helped start a company called Religion of Sports, one of my best friends, and we've done a lot of documentaries with great sports figures. And the idea was that sports are the new religion because sports give us the thing that religion gave us. When I became dean of religious life, people were like, oh, you're the you're the you're the chaplain here. You should know that the real religion here is football at USC. I'm like, ha ha. Until I went to a football game, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the real religion. That's where I saw pilgrimage, the Colosseum, and ritual, and miracles, and agony, and ecstasy, and mythology, and intergenerational transmission of wisdom. So in this, we got to meet and work with some of the greatest athletes, Kobe, um, Simone, LeBron, and I got to spend some time with Steph and. I remember I was talking to him about uh, Steph Curry. I was, I was talking to him about um, the basketball season, and he was talking to me about this, the season. And then I'm like, I was confused. He's like, no, I'm not talking about this season. I'm talking about the season of life for me. 
I'm just like, that is such a, uh, here I am, the spiritual guy, talking about the NBA season, and here he is, this <laughs> basketball game, talking about seasons of life. I'm like, I gotta, you know, I'm gonna my dog, but I definitely just have yours. I did not get that jump shot. But uh, um, it made me rethink of, rethink of, of, it made me think about my life in a different way. And maybe a good way to think about this is it's a new season for you. And can, we're going to have someone come in that's going to spend a considerable amount of time on, on identity, purpose-based identity versus achievement-based identity. And I'm an athlete as that my identity means. Uh, sometimes in life it's going to change and you're going to have no control over it. You think about today, if you follow sports, um, you know, someone very close to this program and, and to my heart uh, is no longer a head coach uh, of the Seattle Seahawks. If his identity was only as a coach, Imagine how crushing and debilitating that is when someone takes away your identity, when someone takes away your company, you lose it. I mean, this happens in life. And so we're gonna talk about the, um, the science of identity. It's so important in everything you do, including habits. Habits, you know, how do you change behavior? You can do it on, based on results, you can do it on systems, and you can do it on identity. You know, spoiler alert, which is the strongest way to change it? It's identity. I am a physically fit person. That's why I exercise. I am a great musician. I'm not telling myself. That's why I practice. So we're going to dive deep into that. It's a great question, and I can't wait to, to, to hear about it. A couple more. Okay. This is um, awesome. Let's go to the back. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I have a question about the intuition. Okay. So just personally, I believe like a person that tends to like carry a lot about what people think. Yep. And making decisions sometimes I question if I'm doing it just because I'm supposed to be doing it or yep. if I actually want to do it. So with that being said, what are some ways to improve your intuition or some everyday practices you can do to, I guess, learn how to trust your God? How do you think about it? And like, how, how, do you, how do you say sometimes you feel like you are doing things because that's what's expected versus that's what you want to do? It's like, for instance, in like a career path, yeah. like sometimes it's like everyone around you is like telling you these are like the certain career paths like, you should take yeah. what you should do. Yeah. And just like, I don't know, sometimes I'm just like, yeah. okay, like, yes, like, that is definitely a successful path and you need to be successful in it. Fulfilled life, but at the end of the day, did I come up with that or yeah. is it just something like intuition? I, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't pretend I know the answer to any of these questions, but I'll, um, some thoughts. Uh, you know, when you talk to people about what they think you should do, they're telling you more about themselves than they're telling you about you. It's important. Like when you're going around talking, to, just say you talk to five different people about your career, and you want to be these five different things, so you talk to five different people, they're going to tell you about them. They're going to tell you about what they don't like about their career. Uh, they see it. But they're going to tell you more about their own hopes, dreams, and aspirations than yours. It's important to hear all the different perspectives, but I think when you're making a decision for yourself with consequence, you are the one who lives with the consequence. You are the one who lives with the results. The people who are advising you do not. They are living with the results of their own actions. You will live with the results of your own decisions, right? No one can escape sort of the you know, consequences of their own decisions. That's causality. So you have to be a little selfish. You know, you have to put yourself, it's not selfish to take care of yourself though. You know, it's not selfish to put yourself first. If you, if you fulfill yourself, you can fulfill others. If you serve yourself, you can serve others. If your cup is empty, it's hard to do anything for anyone else. And so, um, it's important to listen to people, especially if you care about them. It's important to, to know that they care about you and they're trying to give you their best advice, but that that's their best advice. That might not be your best advice. That what is what worked for them. That might not be what works for you. They don't live with the consequences of the choices you make. You live with those consequences, right? And so I would just lean into that. And if it's clear, sometimes it's not clear. It's not always clear. I don't always know what I want. That's what I realized. And what I think I want sometimes is actually not what I want. But if it's clear that you know what you want and other people are telling you something else, um, I hope you find, like I said, one of the top regrets in life is, I wish I had the courage to live the life that I wanted to live. This is an example of that. This is the time where you make that decision so you don't have that regret down the road. Last one, make it a good one. Last one. Why'd you call him the last one? 
Oh, geez. First time? Uh, who's got one that they think applies to a lot of people in the class? All right, we'll go with you and I'll get you next week. And, and if it's really important, he'll answer. Um, I think something I've taken away is how like, the emphasis on relationships and kind of investing in them in order to like, not have regrets later. My question is right now when relationships are changing, how do you grapple with like expectations and the idea of like maybe people letting you down when you're so tied to people on like yeah. such a volatile time? That's a great question. You know, relationships are changing, people let you down. Humans are imperfect. Anything that has a human element is going to be imperfect. So we have theoretical ideas of what a relationship should be, and then we have the messiness of what a relationship is. That's what it means to be in a relationship. I think it's important not to have an idealized version of what that is, but a realistic idea of the messiness of what a relationship is, of the ups and downs, the you know, starts and stops, the pain and the joy. That's, that's the full experience. Um, if people let you down, you know, I, I think they're, you know, you, you have, there's a saying like, show me the people who you hang out with, your five friends, and I'll show you who you'll be in five years. Uh, I always thought that was corny, but now I think it's totally true. You are the people you hang out with, right? If people are constantly letting you down, or if it seems to be a toxic relationship, or if they're taking and not giving, or if you feel used and abused, then you should be in that relationship. You are the people you end up hanging out with. And so find yourself people who are you know, supporting you non-judgmentally. Um, People will let you down. That doesn't mean that the relationship is toxic, but hopefully it's strong enough for you can articulate that. And then I would say just be be empathetic. You know, all everyone here is a college student. Everyone here is trying their best. Everyone here is overwhelmed. Sixty-five percent of our campus is so anxious they have trouble functioning. People are in a tough spot right now, and sometimes we think that people are acting a certain way towards us, but it has nothing to do with us. It's just manifesting or presenting in a way that feels like it's towards us. So we give people who you care about the benefit of the doubt, and sometimes there are things that people are going through that we just don't know about that are causing them to sort of present in particular ways that we might interpret as intentional or not. Well, speaking of relationships, I, uh, I can't be more thankful for your, uh, your friendship and for you showing up for us. Um, I, I've been at SC, you know, teaching a class for 20 years. Um, I am so grateful that we met and I got to do some things together and I, I'm always learning from him. I mean, I, he's a few years younger than I am, as you can probably see, but I just really uh, learn a lot from him. And so I always want to anchor a semester on mindset and flourishing and thriving with someone who really can give the advice that's sort of tinkered in, you know, ancient wisdom meets technology is sort of, you know, uh, he's called like Kaplan for the soul if you're reviewing for, for, um, uh, for a test and just brings so much depth. And so he's available to us, um, you know, if you need him and his department, I, I really encourage you to, to find him uh, in, the, in the Office of Religious Life and Spiritual Life. Um, I grew up with without religion. It's probably the subject I know le the least about. So I was always intimidated by it. And so then to find someone who sort of humanizes it and provides the wisdom, not through necessarily a religious lens, and very uh, approachable and relatable to me. So I've learned so much from you, and I'm just so grateful. Please uh, thank Dr. Barron so much.